product designer, service designer, there's many names for what I do. Uh, but I started out more as a graphic designer earlier on my career. So I started out from UI design and now I focus more on UX research and also more of a flow map design and understanding like strategy. So more in the front part of it. So I have experience in all aspects of UX design. I worked in the field, so like real world. So hopefully what I'm bringing to the table for this webinar is something that I have experienced myself. So these are some of like either process map, bunch of maps that I've worked on in my career. Um, because I do have a visual design background, you can see that a lot of my maps do have that quality sometimes. However, not all my maps are this beautiful. It sometimes happens. It all depends on what they're asking for and who are my audiences. And even if you don't have the visual design, you'll be able to do enough to kind of communicate through using maps. So yeah, let's jump in. What is customer journey map? That's what we want to learn here, right? So what is it? Yeah, what? So journey map actually is one of the UX tool, like deliverables as they call it. There are so many tools and deliverables UX designer use in their process and it's one of them. And we'll cover later how it's related to user experience design, but basically it's one of the many tools that you could use. And according to Nielsen Norman Group, great resource. I did use a lot of their resources. They have a lot of good information, especially about research. And um, like journey map is visualization of the process that a person, or I call say persona or user type, like goes through in order to accomplish a goal. So it is a visualization of process. I want to emphasize that. And then remember, like there is an actor to it who is like a user type or persona. So why do we even care about this? And why is so many people interested in this user journey mapping or customer journey mapping? Because it helps to visually communicate stories to our teams and stakeholders. It's a like visual communication tool is a good way to put it. Um, think about this. I'm sure you guys have this experience. You're in a meeting and then people are telling you what they think. They have a lot of ideas and opinions and you're ideating around a certain topic and people are like, hey, I think we should do this because and another person is like, no, I think we should do this. No, I think the user want this. It's there is a lot of like opinion like my opinion versus your opinion. And some person is just spaced out thinking about next vacation that they want to take. They're just like, man, what is going on? It's hard to follow. Um, it's not based on data. It's just, and then the meeting goes really long and that's a painful meeting you probably don't want to be in. I'm sure everyone has that experience. It doesn't matter what field you're in. So this verbal communication has flaws. So there's easy for team members to get disengaged who are not talking and then not as opinionated, like the person who's thinking about vacation. Um, and then there's people like, you don't know if people understood that verbal communication the same way. You know, when you have the talk, you tell someone the telephone game, like it ends up at the end, like completely different words. Like people might, like kind of pass on things differently or understand things differently. And there's no way to gauge what is going on in people's heads. Um, also, it's easy for meeting to go off tangent and people are just like talking about random things and then they can't focus because they go on one path and then they have to come back. And it's also say that you had that meeting and then later someone else who wasn't in that meeting or exact or someone who is important ask about what happened and there's like no way to look back and find what if what has happened other than maybe someone took notes and they're in like words form and it's in that format and you have to dig through them and who likes reading these days right that's like one thing that i have learn from this job is people do not read and these notes are not, not really useful to go back to. So that is kind of what we're dealing with right now. Give me one sec, I'm trying to. 
I have a two screen and I, I just click them. So the story captures like attention and it provides clarity and inspires team and stakeholder to take action. So when a story is told in a visual way, it's even more effective. And there's some other like forms of visual communication in user experience, like user journey mapping. Like journey mapping is not the only thing. There's storyboards, and then there's also four types of mapping. I will just quickly go over them, not to confuse you guys, but just to let you guys know that these all exist in the world of UX, and they're kind of used in a similar way. So this is an example of storyboard from Nielsen Norman Group. Um, and storyboard, you can think of it like um, children's book. So instead of like you're telling a story or cartoon or comic strip, you're trying to tell a story of how things are or how things could be in this like panel by panel story. Um, sometimes this can be even done in um, like picture by picture so that you're kind of framing the story and letting the people know what is happening in more story format. I think mapping, including journey mapping, is more, you can add more data and you can organize data in a different way because you're using diagram. So this also comes from Nielsen Norman Group and there's, they outline four different maps. There's empathy maps, there are customer journey maps, there are experience maps, service blueprint. There's just so, so, so much tools out there and it could be very confusing. So let me like quickly go through them and then I will tell you what I feel about them. So empathy map, um, in one short phrase, they help team members understand users' mindset. They kind of go hands in hand with something called persona. Um, it comes from research, so a lot of user interview, and then this is a way to synthesize data and group information to really understand you, your user better. Um, so it's not chronological, it's just more data driven. They divide these section into say things, does and feel, and you kind of try to get into the head of the users. <clears throat> and there's always one empathy slide, empathy map for one user type, aka persona. And I generally define user type or persona as people who share similar motivation and goal and patterns. So experience map is, it helps team member to gain understanding for general human behavior in certain topics. So like their clothing shopping behavior, um, their experience of having a child, um, that type of work. I went to DMV like a couple months ago when we were able to go to places and my like general human experience of going through that, um, getting my new license renewed. Um, so this is done generally at the beginning of the design process, even before journey mapping. Um, and this is also part of synthesizing research notes from user interview. And this has to be organized in a chronological way. This helps to like get you guys sense of which area like would be a great opportunity place to enter like market wise. So our customer journey mapping. So they focus on specific customer interaction with product or service. Um, they're either at the beginning point of the design process or the recommending an idea. And I'll go into the more deeply about what's the difference between those two types of journey map. But um, it's also chronological, it's very action-based. Um, and this is like a story you're telling through diagram. And even though it's customer interaction with product or service, but you don't go very specifically, but you're still like a little bit more in the user goal of why would they want to use this product or service? And how are they using this product or service? So this is um, Norman, it's like Nielsen Norman Group uh, outline of the journey map and how it's set up or how it could be set up, you could say it's a little bit like a template. Um, so in this case, is at the top section, you see the number one and two, it's about the lens. So whose story is it? 
you read a comic book or anything, there is usually an actor and who's that actor? And, you, and that's someone that you want to target for your customer journey, for your product. And then the middle part, the experience is what they're doing. Um, the number three is phases. So it's a different action group into a bigger buckets. And then number four is a little bit more of like action. I usually call them the most important thing in a customer journey mapping because it's what they are doing. And you know, when you read the story, you want to know like this person did this and then did this and then this happened to them. So that is kind of a spine that holds everything together on a journey map. And then number five and six, you could add different aspects to skin or decoration to this journey map by including emotions, thoughts, what kind of tools they're using, um, depending on what you're trying to communicate to the stakeholder. Um, the last part is insight. If you find any opportunities that you have discovered through mapping, you can kind of point them out here. And if it's also a larger journey where there's multiple owners in the company working on that section, then you can add that information as well. Also, this is the zone A, B, C explanation. Um, you guys can read it later. I think we might send you guys slides. I will have to ask Jonathan, but um, they're all in the Nielsen Norman group information. So the last one, service blueprint. So this is counterpart to customer journey map. It focuses on detail. So it happens after journey map and then it's chronological like journey map, but you go in deeper regarding like what is customer seeing versus what's happening in the background? What are like the different people making it happen? What are the system that is working? That type of more detailed information will be added to service for blueprint. With all that said, I said a lot and there was a lot of maps. It's really confusing. In my real life, in reality, there really isn't too much sticks distinction between these maps, meaning I have worked on things where it crosses somewhere between service blueprint and experience map and customer journey map, and they kind of add on to each other or they like merge into each other. Like it has some aspect of some map and then some aspect of some other map. So there is like jumbling situation. Also, what I realized a lot from user experience, um, like working in user experience field, is that there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of naming, and different company uses different wording for things. So just have that in mind and don't get so caught up on what each deliverable literally mean. So these are some examples from my own work that is a little bit mash of everything. Um, so this one is, I used to work for a company called Clover. They're competitor to Square. If you have heard of like point of sale system where small businesses, you know, uses those devices to take payment. So I was in their te uh, growth team um, working on selling the devices online. So the more e-commerce e side of it. And we wanted to understand the small business owners journey as they per decide to purchase a point of sale system. So starting from before lead to all the way to like activating a Clover device at all the way at the end activation. So these are phases. Um, if, and if you look at the front part before lead, it's about searching for a POS system. This was more like experience map in a sense because we're trying to understand how our business owner people search for and search and shop for point of sale device. So in this cases, as you can see that this front part is a little bit more of an experience map. And as you go into more of the lead and opportunity and we go dive into the clover.com specifically starting at the end of the before lead. So they end up on the clover.com to buy the devices. And then 
you will go through application and this is done more in the usability format so it has that kind of quality to it and all these like little little like what is it called like email icons are like almost like service for blueprint this is type of communication that is being generated by different back end system um as the user is going through going through this process so there's like some aspect of service blueprint as well so you can see it's kind of jumbled up but the purpose of this was to use for a meeting with marketing team on understanding what the whole journey looks like for the users and then how we can make that experience more consistent and um not so piecemealed and this was used I think I use a lucid chart to make this. Uh, I do come from design background, but I, one thing that used to annoy me the most is people ask me for typo or um, change of copy situation. So lucid chart, I can invite people and people can edit their own copy as they, as needed. So that is kind of situation where you can see that it's like mix of bunch of map types. This is another example where I had a, when I was working in an agency, we worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield, South Carolina insurance company, and we're trying to map out customer journey of how they, like what are they thinking or what do they want in different parts of their journey when they get hurt to they actually uh, pay the insurance and like pay the price for their service and stuff like that so in this one it kind of looks more like experience map and i don't focus on a lot of things i only focus on like what people are thinking and feeling so because that based on that we're trying to map out what type of data we want to provide um the customer we wanted to recommend to the client that um, form not having a nice form and materials is important but also right time and right moment to send materials is also important um so i will answer a question about the software but i would for now say that it doesn't matter as much try to focus more on the concept of it because as i mentioned i was trained four years on a graphic design um like bachelor degree so um some of these kind of come from that background but that doesn't mean that people who don't have the skill can do it it's just really try to focus on what is the big idea or like what you're trying to communicate and that probably matters a lot more so okay so as i mentioned different companies call call these map differently so in bottom here you know i call this journey map but you know this is almost like service blueprint when i worked for a publicist media on mapping out how people put together digital campaign and how do they like plan for it? How do they do strategy? Because they have to figure out if there is a consistency and how they work agencies to agencies. So this was kind of done. And the purpose of this map was to capture what I discovered through interview. And then I go back to the users and ask them if I captured everything correctly. So this is more to like have that check in with them. And it eventually became something like this, which is much more visual designed just because um, this was to be presented to the C level executives to make decision on what kind of internal tools they need to provide their agencies to make their work better. Um, and in that case, is the most interesting things I learned from working is the higher level you are, or like lawyers, they don't like reading even more and they are very visual. So this visualization combines multiple journey map into the summary where we were trying to prove that they actually share similar 
journey. It's just that how they call things might be different. And any circular movement is when they have to get feedback and then they have to com keep coming back and reiterate on things and different color indicate who is leading that part of the process. And then there are like tools that they use um, like included in this. So this is also kind of a service blueprint, but also journey map type of example. Um, so these ones, like I think this one was on in sketch and these were in maybe OmniGraffle. And then this one probably Illustrator and InDesign. And this one is a Lucid chart, which is an online tool. Um, so as I mentioned multiple times, what really matter is these maps are based on user data and research. It's not like just what I think or what I imagine it to be. It's actually based on real data. Um, and then, oh, the chart is called Lucid chart, L-U-C-I-D chart. Um, and then number second, a second thing that is important that you're clear on what you want to communicate. So depending on that, as you saw from my example, what you decide to include in this map might dramatically change. So what we discussed so far, all the maps we talked about is like focus on understanding your user. And second is like bigger context of your product. So like bigger strategy, like bigger picture of where you want to go. So if you look at this person, we're like focusing on the person and then what's going on around them plus your product. These are like used for bigger picture decision. Um, and a lot of time in, need to include business decision maker, stakeholder or product manager. Um, and the usage usually is coming up with new idea, um, new features. Um, maybe it's a new idea for a startup is a big thing. And then second part is like, it helps to prioritize projects that is going on currently. So those are like the parts that it is used most. And the question that I get most is like, what about these like task flow, user flows and flow chart? I'm throwing out a lot of deliverable names. I apologize, but these are all things that UX designers work with. So those focus more on like inside the product. So if it's a phone app, it's in the phone. If it's um, com in computer, it's in a computer. Um, if it is like a service design, then the actual service. So it is like directly connected to like the designing and the wireframe and actual detail of the design. And we won't be focusing on any of these. So if you are thinking that, but I just wanted to let you know that these are the next steps after certain decision is made on the what to work on from the front part of the designs. So, okay, Q&A time about whatever we talked about so far. So it is kind of about what is customer journey mapping. And this is uh, just a super overview of like what it is. And obviously we'll go in more deeper about how it's related with UX design and how we, how I actually do it. Um, so yeah, ask away. I, I'm, I'm hearing that there is a lot of question on the two softwares. Um, I do have a page for that at the end but you could use any of the design software if you're a design background person, um, Illustrator, Design, maybe Photoshop. <laughs> um, and then, what are some other things? Let me think. I sometimes use Sketch. Now that everyone's moving to something called Figma from Sketch, which is an online version, sometimes I use that. The reason why I like Lucidchart is if I work with Sketch or more design program, it takes me longer time to put arrows. But some of these programs like Lucidchart and OmniGraffle, like that is actually for making charts. They The little arrows click into shapes so you don't have to align the arrows <laughs> so that is stupid reason why i like using them also like online tools you can collaborate with people as well 
Um, I think uh, someone asked a starting point. Yeah, so you generally do start with a little bit of an assumption in the beginning sometime as well. And I find I love mapping myself. Someone asked like, if mapping personally helpful in processing my thoughts. Yes, like very big yes. I always map things out in my normal life as well. And I like seeing things um, laid out more in organized chart form. Lo I love Excel. So um, it really helps me. And as we go through the process, you might see why, how it helps me because I go through the data that I researched like over and over and over in a different format. Um, okay. How much user research do you generally do before making one of these maps like you have shown? Um, it all depends. A lot of the answers for user mapping is depends. Um, depends on timing of the how much time the companies have because people don't really consider research very important part of the process. So you always have to fight for it. I have many, many slides explaining what the research is about to different companies. Um, but the quickest one I could do would be like anywhere in three weeks. <laughs> and then the longest one, like talking to like five to eight people. The longest one I did is a publicist media one. It took a whole year, but there, I was a, not a designer, but just pure researcher. And that was only assignment to me. And there were, we were talking to five different agencies and many people. So that took really long time. Um, I think the biggest challenge I have in going into customer journey mapping is number one is convincing your company to do it. Um, they're, they think it will take too long or it's not valuable. They don't see the reason for it. So trying to argue that is a biggest, I think, number one challenge. And once you have it going, um, right way, the second would be collecting data. Uh, you, there are certain ways you can run the research so that you get unbiased data. And a lot of people think they can do the, they can do the uh, research, but there are certain nuances that is different than some other research that you have to be aware of, um, which I will share. And then I think third is synthesizing. That takes some time to really find patterns and just like learning your flow of finding patterns and discovering bigger findings. And where do customer journey mapping fit into UX UI lifecycle? I will talk about that next. Um, what type of research is done to understand the entire customer journey? I will also hopefully talk about it in the next section. And if you still have questions, feel free to follow up with any question. Cool. I'll move on for now since it's- Yeah. I was just going to jump in and say, just so everyone knows, we received over 250 questions in the last <laughs> two minutes. Um, and so we'll, we'll look to how we can try to get a lot of, a lot of these questions answered. Uh, but just to set your expectations, getting 250 plus questions answered today is just not, it's unfortunately, we just are not able to do that. It's just a short session. Um, but one thing we've done in the past is we try to go back and answer some questions through, um, by taking these questions and then answering them later and sharing the answers after the class. Uh, we'll see if we can do that um, for this, just because I know there are a lot of important questions and they all, all are important. Um, so want to just let's show, uh, throw that out there. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get them all to, to all of them today. And I will, you might get some of your question answers in the next section. So hold on tight. <laughs> so next section is about UX design and customer journey mapping, which um, we had a lot of questions on. So I, you know, Wikipedia, what user experience design is, and this is what we came up with. And I just read it and I thought I highlighted this out of the Wikipedia is um, UX design is a practice of designing products, processes, services, event, omnichannel journeys and environment with the focus placed on quality of user experience and culturally relevant solution. That seems pretty logical description. But then let me give you a more authentic answer from my side or what I think user experience is from my own experience is I think it's following a process of including users and your team. Um, it could be business and technology, like to come up with best experience that user will enjoy. 
So the process part is really, really important. If the process is not there, then everything fall apart. And I have had that happen over and over where without the process, it, I saw the user experience designers not being able to do much. So let's talk about these processes. There's so many of these diagrams out there, which is very interesting. And so this one, it talks about starting from research and then sketching and prototyping and testing and launching, cool. There's this double diamond approach where you discover and then you collect a lot of data and then you define and find pattern and you go into insight and define problem and then you start ideating and then you deliver. Like you come up with a lot of ideation and ideas and then you pick few and then you start prototyping. Another interesting one. So this is all the map that I've Googled. There's so, so, so many, many companies have their own um, people are, there's very common to have like discover and then design and implement. It's so interesting. I think this my simplified version for this class specifically. So I think whatever happened is there is like a discovery in the beginning and then that helps you to like refine project or problem or what you want to do and then that leads to a design and then you test and then you kind of repeat this until you think it's enough to release and other part of being ux designer and doing ux design is collaboration and working with people it's like almost like your coworker or also your users um, is a good way to put it. Um, and a lot of time, the perfect situation that I worked at, which doesn't happen very often, there is a really good communication between technology, meaning engineer, um, business, either product manager or business analysis um, and marketing sometime, and then the design. So three of them really continue to include each other and kind of talk freely without judging, with open mind, that's when you get the best UX happening and the whole process can be followed in a better way. So let's see like in my general thought of how it has happened in the past in an ideal world. Um, so in discovery, there's a like usually UX researcher and product manager and business stakeholders are the leader. They're the one who's deciding what to explore, what to research, um, and then researcher, UX researcher, sometimes they're product designers, um, but whoever is running the research are the one who is suggesting methodology of research to help them find out what they need to find out. But don't forget, we still include like designers, UI designers too, if they can, and then also the engineers, because that way they can, from all the way beginning, they can be aware of what's coming forward and also they can also empathize with users. And then that leads to refining project and the lead here is definitely a business people like product manager. At the end of the day, the UX designers and researcher, we provide data. However, the final decision does get made by business um, and we're just giving them good data to make better decisions but they're the one who decide which project to focus on, which direction that they want to go into. And they're the one who has to really tighten up and give the designer what's the priority. And without that, I had situation happen where you waste a lot of time of designers because you're just working on many things and you don't know which one matters more. Um, and then, but even in this process, they, if they're a good business, they would include feedback from technology and then like visual designers and researcher so that they're taking in all this feedback and making that decision. Um, and then you go to design. So now that business has given you some kind of direction, um, we can go into what we talked about, like understanding user flow and like what are the important features that we should work on, what pages is the main page, um, that kind of thing. But, and then once you're done, uh, sometimes designers and researchers collaborate to come up with tests to see what can they improve on the design before it goes to develop.
thing sometimes. Sometimes like they develop earlier and there's beta. Um, it all differs. But as you can see from this whole process, everyone is part of it. And even there is a lead who is taking charge, but there's always other people that um, is like involved. They're either making decision, they're providing input from their expertise, and they're making sure everything is um, kind of going with everyone working together, not like, hey, this is the best user experience, so we're going to like make this and everyone just listen. And that's like the worst situation. So, OK, where do journey map fit in into this map, this ugly little chart I made here? So if you look, during the discover, you can have a discovery journey map. So this kind of maps out the current state of how product is either being used or other product that is similar is currently being used or how people are navigating in this space. Um, this point out, this helps to point out like pain points and opportunities so that um, the group can hypothesize about what that they can do to make it better. And once they do that, they will come up with um, future state journey map, which is like, hey, we should, this is our idea. I think with this idea, we can make this person's life better. And this is how it's going to be better. The journey is going to be so much happier and joyful. So that is kind of a where it fits in. I think I had, um, I will take like a few more questions, but like pretty quick, and then we'll jump in. Let me see, players. Give me one sec, I'm just reading through. Um, so the question is, in the real life exa example of journey map, do you have a way to track how accurate it ultimately was? Um, I think I've never actually like in real life tracked it myself. I'm not sure like Sherry's experiences, but how it is at generally measured is based on that you'll come up with idea and then you'll work on that project. So they, a project will come out of it, feature or whatever project. And if that, pro, if that project is successful and make changes on the metrics of the how many users are using it or whatever metric you're trying to fill, that kind of proof that that journey map that you worked on paid off type of work. Um, and then I think biggest takeaway and actionable you can take from those maps are like, trying to think. Definitely everyone focuses on a pain point. So like which areas are the users struggling the most or find it really difficult? Um, so based on that, so there might be multiple of that. And then based on that, you compare that to what business wants to accomplish. And then what is the easiest for engineer to accomplish? You kind of do a measuring and then pick one project that would really change that more easily change that so like there's always that meeting with multiple counterpart to try to figure out what is important um their question is also tips for avoiding bias assumption and journey mapping um i think the biggest thing with this is always going back to especially for the discovery like current state journey map you want to always go back to your data, your notes from your research. So actually, if you go back, step back one more step, then um, how you collect the data and you, how you collect the research is biggest effect on how you create bias on your journey map. So the actual data gathering part or research part is really important in not avoiding bias and assumption and journey mapping. Uh, and someone asked, um, 
Is customer journey mapping a re reiterative process until it's ready for design stage? Um, there could be a little bit of an iteration. There definitely is, um, there's definitely, it is reiterative, but you don't want to like continuously work on customer journey map <laughs> because you want to move on and you come out with an action, right? So a lot of time, the current map you take it to the best place as you can that will allow the team to make decisions and then you kind of stop there at the moment and then potentially the future state of journey map could change depending on what people want to work on as a product but um it's not as like iterative as when you're like redoing wireframe or flows um i have done multiple of them but I don't do as many journey map as like the actual wireframing and like doing a user flow or wire flow because this is to really, this is only used when people are like, hey, no one is using our product. What is going on? Like that type of situation. Or like people are like, hey, we want to work on this new ideas, but let's make this new page for the users. And then you're like, uh, do people really want that? So those are the moments that you would use them. So it doesn't happen as often as like daily reiterating, usability testing and like changing your design. Cool, I'll move on to next stuff. I'll come back with more question time. So I'll answer more as I see them. So now going into the discovery, like, let me like get into more detail about what's the difference between these like discovery and recommendation journey map. Okay, so let's, I'm going to start with recommendation one first, because that way discovery one, I can go back and talk more about the research. So journey map that is used for recommendation. It helps to communicate how like product service could work within potential user life and help the user. Um, so it is almost like this without with this, your life could be so much better type of story you're trying to tell. And few of the steps that you can come up with is it still has to be based on research, but then you come up with ideas of what are some of the solution you can help to make the current situation better. And this could include brainstorming potential solutions, but in a higher level, not detail. And then design a recommendation journey map. So this can actually be done as a group exercise or um, by UX designer or UX researcher on their own and then review with the team. Oh, this reminds me, someone asked about question about what is the difference between UX designer and UX researcher. Um, there's many titles in this field. Um, bigger company or companies that separate those roles have situation where researcher focuses solely on recommending right research and writing a research plan and running the research and then synthesizing and providing those result, results to the designers. Um, and usually designers sit in in those as well. And because they need to, they're the one who's requesting some of these research. Um, but if the company is smaller, um, UX designers might be doing research and design and product designers also sometimes is considered that they do quote and quote all stack UX design, meaning they do UX research all the way to UI design. Um, but yeah, the whole UX process is kind of long from like research all the way to interaction animation and like all this more design type of work. Um, and I've never seen anyone who can excel at all parts of it. I know how to do all parts of it. That doesn't mean I'm very good at all parts of it. So that's generally how it is. So. You have to like read job description to really know what they're asking for. <laughs> That's a quick um, tangent there. But yeah, there is a, so you can work on this together. There's resource of like, people might have heard about it. The Google design, Google has, Google Venture has come up with something called Design Sprint. And in that, like, you know, you work with the stakeholders to come up with this recommended journey map. 
um, and then you can share the journey map and you it's like something to be something for people to look at and like talk about and this is when you can iterate them and as i recommended you shouldn't be iterating this like over and over and over hopefully this is only one or two time iteration and your this will result in like deciding on which direction to go um help to prioritize features and things that um the business wants you to work on next um, most common use of this I've seen is on in startup pitches, uh, a lot of student works. I mentor for many like programs and also set in in one of SVA user like interaction design course, their final review. And this is a great way to like communicate your idea. So you can be like, hey, my product is a um, certain like shoe collector app. And um, this is a journey of this person. If, if they have that this app, they'll be able to do this X, Y, and Z. Or it's like for companies, it's good for pitching like new feature. <laughs> and the other side of it, the discovery journey map, <clears throat> which I actually do much more than recommendation in the past myself. So this one is like, it helps to communicate what users, what the users need and where the opportunities lie. So it's like, what is happening now? You're like kind of being observant. And actually they're best when they're used together, the discovery and recommendation, because everyone knows that the story is so much more intriguing. It's like, Oh my God, it's so bad before, but with this, my life improved, like the transformation. I have learned from someone giving presentation is really good if you like start with, oh, we were like Apple presentation style is like without iPhone, life was like this, but with iPhone, it's great. So the journey map, if used together, you can like create this story that people can really get sucked into. It's like, wow, that was really terrible what's happening right now. But with this, it could be so much better. So it's a great way to communicate your idea and sell your ideas as well. I think someone just like, the interesting thing is someone just asked, is it best to create before and after? So definitely like, yes, it's the best if you can do before and after. <laughs> So how do you do the discovery journey map? So as I mentioned all the way at the beginning of the webinar, it's like, it's all about the story. So you want user to tell the story and it's really important to capture the story well, uh, meaning non-biased and really straightforward and clear. That means you have to really do a good job of capturing notes. Um, and then you synthesize those notes and then it's all about finding patterns um, based on what you have learned from your interviews. And then you create your journey map. And then that could potentially kick off ideation meeting where you decide on like what you need to prioritize, what if this new feature they're thinking about is even worth it or not, or should they pivot, that type of communication and discussion happens. So this is like a two, um, I'll have a Q and A regarding like two different discovery and recommendation journey maps. So let me see if there are any questions, give me one sec. Okay. I'll read this one. When presenting your design process to internal team, how much detail do you add in the EPT? Should the client know all the inter iteration and change? Um, so when you're presenting your design process to your internal team, you just want to show them the latest one final one because um, they don't have to know the, all the iteration. It's I think it's good to show that for your portfolio that you can iterate, but for sake of communication, even your internal team is busy. I remember product managers are really busy and engineers are busy. So you want to get to the point as soon as possible. So I would say that is kind of more important. 
but you could if there's anything that like stood out and that is weird you can always point that out in your presentation uh, it's not related to this but if i define and elaborate wireframes um i would recommend you looking more into the ux design but they are like the sketches or like almost a design to how a page would look let me see so startups don't necessarily have money for research can a map base and a trend research and openly available information instead I agree startups don't have a lot of money for research, but don't get so alarmed by it. You can still do it the way as a startup. I've done it, done this um, journey map at least for two different startups. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about it, but the difference between using survey and like, like existing data versus like actually talking to real people, you will be surprised what you different thing you will learn. But then there is a lean way of doing this customer journey map at the startup. And you don't have to pay so much money getting this, like um, getting users and stuff like that. So hopefully like a little bit later, I'll explain how I can do that. I have a case study of how I did it for a startup once um, and what it took. So maybe that will help you. And let me think. So someone asked, this is a massive amount of research backed work, but what if it just ends with client giving subjective feedback that completely disregards your recommendation? So yes, that happens. I have had that happen, unfortunately, but it happens less so than you think, because instead of you saying that this is just based on your own thoughts and ideas, you're giving them real numbers and like you can capture quotes and stuff to like give that more meat where people, when people say, see that this is a real people that are talking about this, they're more likely to buy in. So say that I worked with like 10 clients then like one or two rejected it. So it's generally pretty good. And there is a way you can do it in more lean way. As I mentioned, like the publicist media, that was whole year, but generally you can do it in like two, three weeks, depending on how fast you can synthesize, how fast you can recruit user and how collaborative your team is in helping you get that. Uh, someone talked about also consistency in questions. Um, I will go more into the research and I will talk more about that there. I'll definitely talk about identifying people to do customer journey mapping with in the research next section. And I will share a case study for the lean journey map. Uh, all right, I think a lot of these questions are good way, good, good uh, segue to the next section about research. All right, so how to run research for the journey map? Yay, exciting topic. Oh, yeah. I am an enthusiast of research. So as I've mentioned, probably at this time, at least five times, good research lead to good journey map. Um, and when you have that, it becomes solid base for like rest of the product development. And before we start that, let me like go over a few things very quickly. Survey versus interview. I get this questions a lot during customer journey mapping workshop. Um, so surveys versus like doing an interview. So survey, you can find out like what is wrong and you can, and it's good for capturing like simple information and numer numerical or short text form. But the issue with survey is you have to like you can't get some of the behavior nuances of like why people did certain things 
because they might not verbally express that very well, even if it's a short text form. So if you, it's hard to like go off tangent if there's something else in their mind that would be interesting that is not captured in a survey. Um, therefore, it's not actually very good for journey mapping in research and you usually I have actually myself never seen survey used to create journey map. Um, interview is kind of used to find out why. So it's capturing discursive or complex information on people's thoughts, feeling, behavior, and belief. So like you can really capture the psychology. If you love psychology, you will love this. You're trying to get into that person's head and understand why people do certain things and what motivates them, why they do things in certain order, um, and their feelings and their thoughts about it. So it's so exciting to kind of do them, and it's better suited for customer journey mapping. Another question I get a lot, um, because I have worked in companies with marketing team, and I do know that a lot of marketing folks are interested in journey mapping as well. Um, and obviously, I'm lecturing from the perspective of UX design, how we see journey mapping. Um, so there's not a question about what's the difference between marketing research and UX research. Um, they're not the same, but this doesn't mean like either one is unimportant. Like knowing mar your market, knowing your user are both very important, but um, so they're not completely different, but they're complementary and they like guide each other. And let me give a little more information on that. So marketing research, like what do people want? You're talking about like what do people want and you can segment by nature and like you're analyzing attitude. Like what do people feel about it? What is their opinion and stuff like that. UX research is focusing more on like what is useful for people and focusing a lot on behavior. Like what are people doing? Like what are like what did so we segment them by how like their goal and their behavior and then we analyze how they do things <laughs> their behaviors so a lot of time marketing research can cast a wider net to get a sense of the feel of how people are reacting to your products or could react to your products um, but ux research is generally a smaller set um, and you can get pretty consistent you can start to get pattern with five to eight people if you have the right target audience so i'll caveat that with having right target audience which i describe it as people who share same motivation and goal so for journey map um for these reasons that i have outlined we focus on qualitative user research and do usually do one on one interviews anywhere from 30 minutes to hour. I've never gone too much farther than hour unless like there is so much information that needs to be captured. But I try to at least cap it at one hour. With that said, I have done focus group of three to five people, uh, not because that's ideal, but my company wanted me to do it that way. Um, and that comes with challenge and like my company had either time constraint or sometime when I talk to people who, who are actually doing the work who I want who, who will actually use the product they have bosses or managers and their managers don't want them to spend so much time so they their manager wants me to talk to three of them at one time um, the issue with that I found was there's always talker and like who will talk a lot and the rest of the other people kind of agrees so if you talk to three to five people you get like one or two persons data so, um, and you have to be very um good about facilitating and making sure everyone is talking which is difficult yeah so it's not recommended but it happens um so coming back to this well, actually, this is a different map, even though it looks the similar as the other one. Um, as you can see, my visual design skill set has deteriorated of significance since I left my graphic design 
field. Um, so this is a step that you I follow for UX research. You prepare and then you like run the research and you synthesize and you share. Let me just ask a quick question about ethnographic research better than interviews. Um, so in the case of uh, journey mapping, ethnographic research wouldn't work because you're trying to understand how person is doing things. And you can't really do that with ethnographic research. Anyway, we'll dive into the prepare part. So things you can do here is you want to think through potential target audience for your product and you want to recruit them and then you want to draft research plan. Those three things have to be done. Um, there were a lot of questions about potential target audience for your product. So like, how do you pick them? Like, what do you find? Like, what is up with that? Um, so like target audiences, someone mentioned this in a question, but there are some hypotheses you have to draw to come up with some of these information. Like you can't just go and um, do like just interview everyone and hope for the best. Um, when you're working on your product, you have general sense of who might be the user. Um, meaning like who will most likely to use your product the most. Uh, I've been taking some marketing courses and it's interesting that it lines up with UX in a way everyone wants to serve everyone i'm sure everyone have heard of that but they cannot serve everyone and you have to narrow down your user and yes potentially you might find out that some other user type is attracted to your product or service however you have to start somewhere with one type of person or your product won't be focused it will be confusing and it will lose direction, basically. So um, you want to at least take a guess at your primary user. And you, there's some ways that you can recruit participants or screen participants. Um, when I worked for like a bigger company who had money, they would use usertesting.com a lot. Um, they have moderated and unmoderated tests that you can set up. And even if you do moderated version, they have screening questions and you can kind of screen people and they'll find people for you and kind of schedule a time. If you like give open time, which is pretty great. It usually happens in like day or two. And then um, I saw my other client who's in a startup use userinterviews.com. This one is more for moderated tests, I think. Um, and you can find people by demographic and some other questions. Um, Usercrowd.com is also somewhere you can find people. And these are all paid service, so a lot of time you have to have the money. Um, existing users. So say that someone mentioned, like, can you have, like, a... actually someone asked a question that I, like, kind of saw in the corner of my eyes about having a collection of users that you can tap into for user research. Uh, you can do that for sure. Um, may, if you're trying to find out something that is already happening, it's kind of like, for example, you want to be aware of what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get new type of users and new future feature that it, or like new product like startup, um, in that case is, number one, you might not have existing user. And number two, <laughs> you might... Um, need someone who is, might fall into your user group, but not your user yet. So that you can kind of see um, what they're doing so that you can potentially maybe get them to join you. Um, however, if you're doing a, say that you're launching new feature and then you want to do user journey about new feature um, and certain area of your product, then feel free to reach out to your existing users. When I worked at Shutterstock, um, we reached out to our current users. So I worked in a team that worked with people who create content, meaning they're called contributors and they're the one who create those stock images um, or footages and then they submit it and actually they get paid if they're 
artwork get downloaded. And those people, when we were trying to launch new dashboard for them, um, we reached out to the email list from them and then we provided compensation. And generally at that time we did like 20 to $25 Amazon gift card. And then thirdly, which is more common, small budget or informal situation, like your startup, I worked with multiple startup and, you know, they don't want to spend, they don't have the money and they don't want to spend money on like these recording tools or like you can't give compensation sometime. Um, it's not as ideal, but you can always ask friends of friends if they fall into any of your target audience group, if you can try that. Um, and then try with your colleagues who might fall into that. Maybe they are not your exec team member, but you know, they might fall into your user type or you can put out like social media or Craigslist type of places. Friends of friends are the one I use the most for the startup situation because like friends of friend or friends of friends of friend, there's someone who falls into your user group. Use your network. So now talk about like making hypothesis on who you think you can, they can help you collect data to meet your research goal. So I'm going to go through this quick case study. Um, and this is part of a research plan. So um, how I put that together and I call the screener because this is who I'm trying to interview for this journey map interview and the startup in nutshell is they were trying to build a content product where people can uh, consume content online without bias and also kind of read more social aware pieces online and share their belief with other content creators and readers. So his, the founder's hypothesis was that there is a gap in how people consume content online, especially socially or politically charged content. Um, and he wanted to create this like belief network. And that's like a different way that you can discover new content. So when I joined the startup, he had the same idea as most founders that he wants everyone to be part of like use his product because he's like, no, well, everyone should use this product. And when I suggested this user type, he was like, but what about behavior change? And I get that question all the time. Um, behavior change is great. Behavior change is difficult. I'm not sure if you try to change your own behavior. It's not easy. I try many times. Um, so you don't want to start with someone like expecting a behavior change is a good way to put it. Um, for example, I would, I probably will not be the main user for the product that he's working on because I really don't read that much online. <laughs> um, so if I don't read already online, I don't, then why would I even be interested in trying this new product? Because I don't read right now. Therefore, if you think about it, so here I'm trying to talk about hypothesize who would be the main user for this idea. So it's like, they have to read regularly online. Like they have that behavior pattern already. They read online every day and they're interested in like politic, nonprofit, social justice, like any sector that communicates strong belief. So not like casual reader who reads like memes. These are people who are like into like portraying their belief and like expanding their thoughts type of people. So I put that out as a initial hypothesis of who I would look for. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, UX research versus marketing, um, like marketing would focus on demographic uh, screening, but UX research will focus more on the behavior based screening. So these are like potentially 60 years old who does, who reads every day online and who is so socially um, charged person might be acting similar to 30 years old. Who knows? 
because their motivation is their motivation and goal might be same. So we try to keep focus on the behavior, but we do note the demographic information because for some reason we realize the 60 year old and 20 year old are different than you might consider that um, demographic. Here we put 21 and over because younger than that they're in college and um you know it's like a different mindset than people who are working so as you can see here we're focusing on the behavior another part of the research plan is the goal um this is to align people on the why they're doing this research <laughs> like in first hand so um Goal for this research that I worked on in 2019 is we want to understand re use readers' current habits, um, and then we want to understand their motivation. And the last two is a different part of the test, so I'll skip it. But first two is related with their journey mapping. So research plan, a lot of people don't do them. I'm a big believer of it because this is another time to align yourself and collaborate with your team. And also this kind of keeps you in line with what you're doing. And I think long, long, long time ago, I saw a question regarding, do you keep your questions consistent? Um, the an short answer is yes, because we want to get same data, consistent data. So when you're synthesizing it there, you're synthesizing data from a same feedback, but how you do it is slightly different. And you might, I will explain that in the research plan. The major part of research plan is aligning on script. Um, you kind of start the interview with the intro, you know, like getting comfortable, um, like giving overview of what's going to happen today. Um, the challenge here that I've seen from a lot of students is you don't want to be too detailed about what you're going to talk about. So it's like, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm working on a startup who's doing a content platform for sharing belief. So, and all these things, because then that creates certain mindset in the interviewee and they will answer things to fit that box. So you, but you don't want them to keep, you don't want to keep them in the dark. So you give them general sense of, I want to understand how your reading behavior is online and like keep it at that. So you don't want to be like too vague and not tell them anything, but like not too specific where you start to create bias. Um, and then the second part about it is, um, I think good way to think about the script is you want to go super general and then more narrow because the narrower you start, then your biases get stuck. So you want to start more general inf information about reading and then go more specific. So the background information I generally start with is general motivation or patterns this person has. So things I ask here is how often do you read and watch recent news or articles online? Like when, what, when do you read it? Like, what do you read about? Like, why do you read it? Do you read materials opposed to your thought? This is all about reading online, but it's nothing specific. It's just more about to understand like why they do reading online in general. And then you ask about the process question. And this is the most important part of the customer journey mapping question is like, Tell me about your most recent experience of reading online. So we're asking about past experience. It kind of relates with screening. Um, so you want to pick people who already are showing that behavior so that you can ask them about what they have done in the past. Um, the reason is I'll explain a little more on my research tip and non-biased researching tip, but um, if you ask people about what's coming up in the future, that is not very accurate of what they really are going to do. So asking them about what they have done in the past, their past behavior is the best way to understand how they function. So, and then as you see here, I have lots of questions underneath it, but one big thing to note, I'm not asking this question one by one by one down the checklist. 
I just ask one question, which is tell me about your most recent experience of reading online. And I have people just talk. There is a situation where someone loves talking and they talk a lot and they'll give you like A to B on how they do it. And then, or they might sometimes go off tangent and you have to bring real them in. Other cases, they're not a talker and they just don't talk and you have to prompt them to talk. So the, all these questions I have here is the data that I want to capture. Best case scenario, someone will answer them without me asking, then I will just mentally check them as I go through them. And if there's anything that I missed, then I will bring them back and ask that again. Um, but I basically want them to explain chronologically what happens from the time that they, they like search for what they're reading, how they do that, all the way to like, what do they do after the reading? So that's what I want to capture because I, as I mentioned before, journey mapping is all about chronological order, right? And a story, it's iconic. It's, um, it has to be understandable by anyone. So in that note, we are, I have these questions ready so that I make sure I get all of them, but I don't get them in this order sometime and I have to come back. Um, so that is why these are, but this is also another part that you're collaborating with the product managers and other designers. Like they might have questions that you might have forgot. And so when they're reviewing your research plan, they have opportunities to add more questions to it. And everyone is in the same page about what they want to find out from your research. And then narrowing down more. You, anything that you, what do you want? Can you like those type of question? You want to put it at the end. So you talk about past experience and then you talk about what you want in the future towards the end. Um, yeah, you have the time of the user is not as important, but if you have the time, why not ask them what they would like? And that doesn't mean you will follow them, but it's a good way to get their idea. So why not? So you can ask them about any blue sky question, what do you want to do, um, that type of thing. Um, and some, and then anything with like top three issue, like I would ask. So the reason why I say like top three pain point, what they like the best in the process till the end, because if you ask people about what's, what was the pain point without number, I had experience where people go on a, a like complaining streak. <laughs> and then how do you this know which one is more important than the other? So when you have the user, like interviewing person think what prioritize the pain point or reiterate the top three pain point, then those are probably the important one. And you want to find out if that overlaps between the people you talk to, if there is any consistency and pattern in what people express as a pain point in the journey. Any question about the only the preparing part about preparing for the research? Let me do a quick one. I know we don't have too much time, so. So a quick question about UX design and the product manager. What is the difference? Um, user experience design, we're focusing a lot more on the user behavior and what the user wants and their like their users need and user like really studying users behavior and like their patterns product managers very very important person um sometimes people should have them before designers um and without them everything falls apart they are the one who talks to the business stakeholder understands the business priority and needs and then also they can understand the technology side of it and they also understand users and then they are making decision on product direction and prioritization based on the data provided by user UX designer and also the technology team. So they're the one who's like, base, this is what business wants, but based on what I heard, this, pro, this direction, we should go this way. And they kind of make sure that everyone is moving together and um, setting 
goals and priorities and feature lists and that type of thing. Um, so they are coordinating everything and making sure the business, at the end of the day, the business need is met in the best way. Cool. Uh, can you? Someone said uh, I have a noise. Let me know if there's any other issue with that. Like it, there's a construction outside my door and it's kind of loud. Um, so running user research, I'll, since we have around 30 minutes, I'll try to go through some of them. Research should run like conversation and you use research plan to make sure you collect all the data as I talked about and you want to be subjective and stay on topic. Um, there were a bunch of questions about recording the session. Definitely record session if you can. Um, from my experience, if you have the luxury, <laughs> it's good to have at least two people in a session, facilitator and a note taker, because as I mentioned, my method, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's like really loud outside, um, New York. So usually, um, I if the team was big enough, there's two person. The reason is, as I mentioned, how I run the research, I don't go through the question. I have to kind of navigate and listen to the user. And depending on what they say, like change directions and pull them back and then bring them back to questions. So there's a lot of like ad hoc things you have to do. Um, so it's kind of hard to take notes at the same time. It's almost impossible. So when you have like extra note taker, it's really great. And in most awesome case that I had in Shutterstock, I had like two, three note taker, like interns and junior designer. And at the end of it, we compare notes. And that is great way to synthesize because it's interesting how through same, you listen to same session, but then how people, what people focus on is very different and it's always fun to have that collaboration. However, that luxury does not exist always. And there's many times that I have to run it by myself and there's no note taker. In those cases, recording is even more valuable because what I do is I record it and I don't take that much note during the session. And then I'll have to re-listen to it later um, which is time consuming, but that helps me to kind of synthesize and process what has happened one more time. And so it's so important to take notes. Great, so I'm gonna give you some practical tip on the running research and trying not to be biased in some of this research process and how this mindset is a little bit different in user experience research. Um, number one tip is approach research with assumption. Without assumption, I mean not with this, and solution in mind. Um, important both for process we know and we do not know. Uh, I always give this example for this where I think the there's an agency called Cooper design agency, and they categorize people into synthesizer and generator. <clears throat> and synthesizer are people who can take a lot of data and then find patterns. And then generator are, you give them one idea and they can brainstorm like 10 different ways of doing different things. They're just creative thinker um, and one is organizer. And they do that because they pair these two to work together because that's like the dream team. Um, but for the purpose of doing research, if you know that you're a generator, you want to shut that brain down and try to really listen and just gather as much data as possible. Tip two is do not ask questions with yes or no, either or that answer. Um, this is a very good indication for leading question, quote, end quote leading question. Um, yes, you can ask some question with yes or no, but it has to have follow-up question. And I'll give you reasons why. This is some example provided by GA. Um, let's look at the left question. Do you like to use free weighted gym? Um, the answer for this is yes or no, right? Um, but then what if I don't use any weight? Then what? how do I answer that? 
if I am more verbal person, maybe I'll tell you that I don't, but if I'm not, I'll just choose one, um, which becomes leading. You're expecting that they use gym or not. And better question will be what type of equipment do you like to use at the gym? That a typo. <laughs> anyway, um, so then the user have to really think through like what they do and they can provide more like better answer. Would you say cardio classes are better workout than weightlifting? What if I don't do cardio class at all, but I have to choose one, right? So I choose weightlift. Um, so better question would be what type of exercise gives you the best workout? Then you can really understand their behavior and without telling them what they should be answering. Tip three, this is why we ask about past experience and behavior for journey map. People's idea about themselves and what they can be is very different. Um, don't, do not ask user about what they would do in the future, what they would like th those type of question. Um, that doesn't provide very accurate data. You can, as I mentioned in the research plan, you can ask these blue sky and magic wand, what is your idea question at the end of the interview so that that doesn't throw the person off from the interview. Um, the, one of the funniest examples someone told me is when Sony was developing Walkman, you know where you put cassette player, maybe some people don't know, but some people might know. Um, so they had people answer questions regarding if they would prefer yellow or black Walkman. And a lot of people actually answered yellow. But at the end of the, end of the session, people can take one home. And every, most people took black home. So what they think they would do and what they actually do is very different. Another good example, how many times do you plan to go to gym this year? 2020, yay. You can say I'm like five times a week because I'm going to get healthy, I'm going to lose weight, um, I'm going to be awesome. But then would I actually do that? Like. Think about it for yourself. Um, compare if you ask them about describe your gym schedule last year. It might still be a little bit uh, manipulated, but probably a little bit more close to what they would do. Of course, um, be sincere and curious and ask why, what, and how. I think. Um, Shari, I think uh, mentioned in the answering, ask a lot of whys. Don't just stop, keep on asking. Tip number five, listen and make sure you're not talking too much. I occasionally see, observe people that the, as they're interviewing, they talk more themselves. Um, you, don't, you're, you, don't have, you have limited time. You want to get as much data as possible. Okay, any question? I see that some question that Sherry has sent me, um, do, do, I, do, do you focus on customer or the user more during a journey mapping research? In my opinion, I think I kind of use them interchangeably depending on what industry and what product you're in because if it is a, you know, like some industry call their user customers, some of them call them user and some of them call them like business owner. So it's the people, whoever is at the end, receiving end of your service and product is whatever you call them. <laughs> um, second question, how do you approach different customer segments? Do you map each one individually? Do you do one map on high level? Um, so customer segment, could be considered as persona. And in those cases, you def if they have completely different journey, you realize that's the pattern, then you'll map them differently. For example, maybe their goal is different. It's like significantly different Then you'll do them separately. If there is like, they're similar, but there's like one area that is different, you can potentially have it in a one map and then, um, kind of use a key to show where the difference is and kind of highlight that. 
maybe use one segment in one color or one area, that, that type of thing. That's kind of more of a visual tech that you can use. Um, do you recommend this as an approach to collaborate with customer project team during implementation of product, SaaS product? Um, so yes, it's a good way to collaborate, especially more towards, actually towards the beginning for discovery so that you guys align on which like priorities or what matters and if you're creating consistent experience for people and maybe also to paint a vision. Um, do journey map just focus on happy pet in the process? Um, the current one doesn't always highlight happy pet, <laughs> but um, potentially the future one, you can uh, provide more happy pet and how you can achieve that. Um, do can a business with a no, I skip one. Do you have example of discovery journey map and how it later evolved into recommendation journey map? Uh, I have more of a discovery one than recommendation one in complete honesty. And I'll, and I'll show you as we go through what that became, you know, the content one I'm going through. Uh, can business metric goal can be added to customer journey map or service blueprint? If so, can you provide example of when that would be appropriate? Uh, I never actually had business matrix added or goal added to the customer journey map because it is a customer journey map and not business map. But we have used that to see where the alignment may be um, between the business goal versus customer goal. But generally, I use them separately in my experience. We only have like 20 minutes, so I'll keep on going and then come back to these questions. <laughs> um, synthesize. Um, as I mentioned, this is another difficult part of the, so learning to facilitate research well is really important and you get better and better as you do it. And with my tips, it hopefully it helps. A lot of people told me from my workshop that really um, got into their head and helped them when they're doing interviews. Um, the synthesizing is also difficult. Um, you have to go over notes. I usually, how I do it, and this is how I'm explaining it, is I go over the notes one more time. I usually have notes in Word doc, and then I put it in a post-it board. And I use virtual one because save the tree, and also that way I don't have to re-digitize them. And I'll show you that tool. And then um, finding patterns in your interview. So let's see. This is a snippet of my research synthesis process. So I go through all the notes and currently how I have this board is that I, you can do it anyway, whatever works. Like a lot of UX is about finding patterns, organizing content and like uh, categorizing things and grouping things. And they call it affinity mapping. They use that a lot. Um, I would definitely look into that, but this, how I did this one, after I researched five different power readers who read online on a social issue, I mapped them, I went through all the notes and captured one idea per post-it and also like tools. And each different color is different person. And so yellow is one person, purple is one person. And anything with like red X's are like, kind of a annoying thing that they expressed or I felt that they were annoyed by. Anything with green checkbox, things that they kind of liked. Um, and then I tried to, these are like cross, what is it called, journey map in a multiple journey map, like layered on top of each other. So I grouped similar things. And this is how I work. This is how I find pattern. Because if you see it in a word doc, it's kind of hard to see the pattern. But when you're like, put them on this board, it's easier for me to like see things and move it around. Um, this is called mural leaf. I think I might have a, and then, um, so that's like how I do it. A lot of people do it differently, but that's the one good way to do it. Any question? 
other than synthesized too. So thing about synthesis, I think that's where the human aspects come in. Obviously, like the whole UX, the fun part is the psychology and the human analysis ability. But I think it's interesting, like being able to synthesize a lot of information. Uh, obviously, I'm sure there are tools and people working on automating this, but there is the joy and, <laughs> on, uh, of like finding patterns that human can do so easily. My friend sometimes joke around who's also a UX designer. She's like, I'm a UX designer, but I don't like automation. She's like, human can do them really well. But <laughs> um, anyway, that was just side thing. But someone asked, how do I deal with like 25 interviews? Like, do I go through the same process? Uh, hopefully I never have to go through 25 interviews. A lot of time, if I pick the right persona, I usually have to do only like eight, maximum 10, but I would guess so that you will go through a similar process. Um, when you, uh, when do you, when do you revisit revise customer journey map? If ever, um, it's very sad, but I have re like, as I mentioned, unless while you're making it, you get feedback and you make like one or two iteration. I have actually never went back and fixed them. <laughs> I don't know, maybe someone else have a different opinion because it doesn't happen as often. So I think unless, a lot of people say in like every few years, like two, three years, they should be redone, especially if bigger changes has happened. For example, right now there's a COVID-19 situation that might have changed some certain journey, um, that type of situation. So there's bigger life changes. I mean, if word changes that affects it, I would say um, those are the time you want to do that or you want to completely change industry, that type of work. Um, Yeah, average customer journey map, because I've been doing it for a while, the fastest I can do, like starting from like researching, I can probably, and everyone is kind of working smoothly together and providing feedback on time, which is very rare. Um, if that happens, I can pump one out in like two weeks, <laughs> two, three weeks. Um, but yes, because like say that I do five, eight interview or 10, that's like 10 hours and for me, like putting together a research plan only takes like two hours and then I get feedback and then, well, I guess sometimes I have to re-listen to them so that in 10 interviews, like 20 hours, and then I will have to like find patterns, provide like visualization. And I do a lot of sketches to try to make that happen. Um, which are usually mis usual mistake when you're using customer journey mapping? Mm. I think the biggest one is like a lot of uh, the ones that are done in assumption. Like um, it's not based on any data, but they're just like making journey map based on what they think. And sometimes that's not always true. So, and sometimes you have to make those map and good way to do it is do that, but also see if you can get more people in the future to validate that. So someone asked eight to 10 user interviews enough to get quality data. I get that question a lot. And I have worked with UX designers on doing journey map and interviews. And every time they do it, they're amazed by how they can find patterns within like four or five. And if they're like, oh, actually, I don't think I need to do more. It's, it, it, you would be surprised actually. But the key point and caveat I always say is, are you talking to the right target audience and do they fall into same user type? If they're not, then you'll be talking to 20 people and there'll be a random answer and random processes. Um, Awesome. I know someone asked about a uh, more example situation where business would want to use this. Let me get to that towards the end so I can go over all of this. So the last part, because I'm almost at the end. 
um, choose a tool based on the audience. So I have created printed poster, um, PowerPoint slides, PDFs. Um, it all depends on what you're going to use it for. And I'm not covering a lot of persona this session because it's two hour and I want to keep us focused on the customer journey mapping. But remember, there's an actor to this and we can call them persona or user type, but there is a per like you have to have a person. <laughs> so that's one way to share. So in this example of the con that I'm sharing with this dark content startup, I'll call them content startup. Um, what I do after that is I go over you know, the crazy process situation and I gather persona, uh, I gather like motivation and persona information and customer journey map information. Um, and then cater the presentation for the purpose. So for this one, I did a PowerPoint presentation because this was a presented to our team before our virtual brainstorming session. So this is a persona I came up with after five people. Um, we call them power reader. In this case, just this is a sake. I made this for the sake of journey mapping. So I didn't focus so much on demographic and like making them like person, but that can be done. Um, the shared attribute between all five of them is that they spend more than 12 hours a week reading articles and books and they have strong appetite for learning and gathering new information and they do not write online like they don't publish stuff and their primary goal is they want to improve themselves and this was shared among all five of them and then secondary goal they want to share knowledge with other people and then their key reading behavior was all of them read mostly about few topic areas they find interesting the second is they consume multi media material like social media blog youtube articles news they weren't just like reading in one place they were reading all over um, and then their interest topic type of thing were based on their work and personal life experience and change and the main pain point they talked about they all shared obviously they had other ones but this one is a shared one they said sorting what to read takes a lot of time and storing content they want to share later is difficult because there's no one way to do it and then some of the blue sky idea they had is somewhere I can view all my content organized by topic area and at a glance and see just the article. Um, so these are like some of the ideas they had. So this was kind of before we go into the journey mapping, this is like a, her, like who whose journey I'm mapping. This is who part of it. And look, this journey map is super simple. I showed you a lot of crazy ones, but this one's super simple. That all this crazy post-it became this thing. Um, and anyone can make this. And this is, as you can see, all of the people follow this pattern. This is a pattern. So that's why you collect a lot of data for research, because when you actually synthesize it, they became kind of simple. Um, and then this is like, they start with search and selecting content, and then depending on if they have no time or time, they categorize content to read later, they consume the content, and then they interact article and comments, and then they do additional reading, so they like keep on reading down, and then categorize store, interesting content, and then they share it with others. So this is like one of the things that they have shared. And this is one page because PowerPoint, and this one has like the notes on underneath it in the blue, but then I had different slides that had different tools people use on this different step, and then what pain point they had in a different, pain, different um, page. So, oh, and one thing that I wanted to point out is that the other side of this research, I was working with another researcher and she was trying to do um, journey map on the writer, like people who write digitally online. And when she talked to five people, she was surprised that they all have different goal and motivation and their patterns were all different. Um, so she had to do look for more people and find reason why they're different. So is it that they're, what topic they're writing? Is it their job? Is it their age? Um, and then she did, she had to look for more people and ended up having like two different persona, one that like writes for 
fun for themselves versus people who write to like publish or like as a job. So sometimes that happens. And what happened after this? So this is what happened. Um, we ran virtual workshop on Miralee um, for brainstorming idea. It was three day workshop. It was three day workshop. It was vaguely based on Google's design sprint idea. So we gave a presentation in the beginning of research findings. So in Google design sprint, they do the testing. They do the testing during the sprint, but for this, we did the testing and the synthesizing and journey map before and based on that we kicked off like ideation process and so that they can decide on a direction to go to and which aspect of the product we need to work on first. It's almost like defining MVP type of workshop. So I recommend learning about in, in like talking about all the tools, um, I recommend learning about basic visual design actually. Um, because that makes final visualization so much better just by knowing like hierarchy, a little bit color and like ty typography situation. Let me ask some, let me answer some questions. Well, a lot of questions. So some example that business would want this is Definitely, if you're starting a new startup, I would recommend having this before starting so that you can verify if there is need in that space and if people like in developing MVP that is differentiated from competitor, that's one. Um, second part is you have a product and no one is, there is, no one's using it or there's some issue. Um, then you want to go back and see where in a customer journey map journey that it's falling apart. And that's one way to look at it. Um, when you want to prioritize project in the beginning of the year, that's when I saw it being used um, to see where with where is that low hanging fruit between users need between business need and like what technology can do and their capacity. Um, and third, lastly, when they, when you want to work on a new feature and you have a idea and hypothesis, you want to see if that is something that people would want. Um, and then the time, when, when should you use quantitative research is a lot of time like finding out what is wrong. Um, I have used in the past where like drop off late rate on the website or web visiting information, like those things. I work with data team and then they will basically highlight to the business there's something wrong and that's then we can find out what is wrong like for example um you know those forms on the website that like people can put in feedback um those tell you like what is wrong like to what people are frustrated with um and then we usually take that and find develop a research plan to find out um why is it that way so a lot of time we use it more so in that way, at least from my experience. Um, is it possible to create one customer journey map to reflect a group of persona that will have shared service and experience? Yes, especially if the journey map, like what is that called? The two-sided marketplace situation, Etsy, um, Amazon, or wherever, like there's like a back and forth in situation, you can add them. Um, I think pro is that it paints bigger, comprehensive picture. Con is that it can lose focus on who to work with. Um, but I've seen those. So it becomes more like a swim lane and then you like go back and forth. Um, Often journey maps are huge. How do you effectively present it to others, especially C-suite? 11 by 17 posts are not always the best, and PPT is too small. So if you're going to C-suite, depending on what they're looking for, but what I realize is like they don't have time. So if it is huge, you might consider cutting down your content for them 
does to customize it for them. So just pointing out the most important part that maybe it'll fit into a, a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so like maybe you have more elaborate version for your team and like um, for people who are more directly involved, but then you can potentially simplify it for the C-suite. Um, for data that you use to create these maps, are these strictly user interviewer data also generated from analytics? Um, these are all strictly from user interview because we're mapping out the behavior. Um, the keyword is behavior. Um, and then, let me see. Okay, so that is it for now. Oh yeah, best way to learn basic visual design. I think there's a small, small workshop or online courses out there. Like, I think you just need to know a little bit about color hierarchy and typography. Tools. Mentioning for probably many times already, not important, but how you use, how you find patterns and sharing that with user is more important. But here are some that I use. Sketch, Lucidchart, um, Visio for PC, OmniGraphle for Mac, Figma, any design software like Adobe, um, PowerPoint, etc. So yeah, that is everything I managed to kind of finish on time. I'll answer like few final question. I know we like started five minutes late, so I can go out until like 105. So let me see if there's any other thing. Give me one sec. Let me see if there is anything. Oh, there is a question. It seems like you're blending the UX research into goals of both developing persona and customer journey map. Is this right? Also wondering how you take that data into more complex visualization. Um, I've done UX research a lot. Okay, but illustrating it into more complex journey map is the graph gap I'm hoping this webinar will fill. Um, so answering the first part of your question, yes, I'm blending UX research into developing persona and customer journey map because customer journey map cannot exist without persona, meaning you have to have an actor. So when I do the um, research, I make sure I collect data for both. And another reason is the, the talking about number of people that you're interviewing, right? Um, and if you collect persona information, like basically being really curious about what makes this person tick. Um, and if you have those information and then you come to a conclusion that, oh my God, I talked to five people and they're all over the place, then you can go back to person like their persona question and see what are the behavior or qualities that they have that make them different so that you can look for additional people that you want to talk to and like which direction you'll go to. Um, so that's why I do them together. Yeah, the whole thing about more complex visualization, I must agree that I, the reason why I know how to do them is I did have four years of visual communication education, um, focusing on information design and like how to organize data into easier to read formats. So that is why I was saying, I think um, people could um, benefit greatly from having a basic of visual design and just looking at a lot of examples of other people's work, other graphs, other maps. I think those are a great way to get better. Uh, music. Oh, got it. Someone saying me covering my mouth with my hand, it's making sound, sorry. <laughs> um, technology. Another question is, how do you use output from your discovery customer journey map into your future customer journey map? So how do customer journeys? Yeah, so output from your discovery to future. So if you have discovery one, then you could use that one to find opportunities and solutions 
And when that happens, then you can, with your team, or you can suggest it and get feedback from the team. That's like two routes that I usually go. Um, you can, coming up with future one based on a current one is almost hypo, hypothesizing, like you're making yes, um, but then, but recommendation based on data. And so you can kind of take the old one and then have a discussion around it and move it around to change it into a future one. And if everyone agree that future one is one that they want to pursue, then that is that will kick off like more detailed vision of what design to work on. Um, do you do customer journey for each persona? So as I mentioned, Yes, you do technically, but say that two persona had a similar journey with one part that is different, then sometime I would add them together and just point out that that's the area that's different. Or if there's two marketplaces where two people, two persona are talking to each other, then I might have two of them in the same per same customer journey mapping. Uh, let me see, like two more minutes. If the journey map has never been done before for an existing startup product, would you recommend doing one now? If yes, what should we be seeking? Uh, definitely yes. It kind of holds your vision together and holds your team together um, and help you to paint vision for the future of like upcoming projects or where you want to go to. And also just better understanding and empathizing for the users. So I rec recommend doing them. Um, and a lot of time I end up doing them later in the process. Like people hire me and they're like, I recommend doing it. And they're like, oh yeah, we should. And then they find out interesting things and a lot of the interesting projects or direction can get kicked off from that. And what should you be seeking if you're trying to do it now? Try not to like, seek for anything or try for anything or think that there might be certain solution try to have open-minded just try start with um, what area um your product is in and then what you what's the main user goal that your users are achieving through your product and then start from that point and you want to find out how you're like reach out to your potential customer or customer you already have and see how their current experience is like and how they are currently doing things in that space is a good way to think about it. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Uh, okay. I think this is a good one. Let's say that, wait, two types of, you have two types of user in mind. Should you still narrow down to eight interview or do 16? Um, I would say from a business, so this is when the whole product manager and business comes in as well. I would definitely try to prioritize one and that comes from uh, brainstorming and communication with the team and product manager. And then like at first really focus on one person, like one uh, primary persona. I think if I can add like a few more and then we're good. So I think these are kind of like blended. So it's like creating journey map first step in UX designer's job um, is next step starting designing. Um, and wouldn't they need to have visual design experience for that? That is why I said there is spectrum of UX process starting from UX research. And then you do what we talked about and then you go into like the, what is that called? Like flows and actual screen flows and stuff like that. And then you actually go into the wireframing, the content and content information architect. And then you go into like a high fidelity or they call it like more refined design and how they move, how they animate. So it's like really, really long process. Um, so 
yes, it's a first step, but first of all, like no one, not everyone does customer journey mapping, even though they should. So um, sometimes it's not first step, but depending on what role you're in and what kind of company you might be not, you might not need visual design experience to be a UX researcher is, or UX designer even, you only do up until like sketch of a wireframe and content. So, and generally, like amazing UI designers are like really good at these interactions and like something that I'm not very good and it comes with practice and exercise. I know people who taught themselves if they're if you're really interested in that. Um, and do you find UX designer most time researching idea generation rather than visual design skill? Um, like I said, depend on your role and how the company is divided up. And I mentioned about user flow, but user flow is like in the app or in the website, in the service, like how you are clicking through your stuff or how you're moving through that service. Um, yes, hello from someone from Kenneth Cole. That was like 2009. <laughs> um, yeah, and you can apply this model to any industry. Um, you can map it for yourself. And it's really fun, so I really recommend. Um, so thank you so much for joining, and I think that's it for today. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. We received about 800 questions in total, um, so appreciate the patience. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions. Um, I'm going to look into see if there's a way to uh, get some more some more of these questions answered. There are a lot though, so please just be. Um, patient with us as we try to answer as many questions as possible. We'll be sending out the deck and the recording, um, hopefully with the questions that you, you asked here uh, and the answers to those questions after the class. It Hopefully we'll get it out to you today. Uh, the recording sometimes takes a while to finish uh, processing and, and, and so we might not be able to get, worst case, we won't get it to you until Monday. So just if you don't get it by Monday, then please reach out. But um, Anyway, thank you all uh, for joining today. Thank you, Minnie. Sherry had a jump. Um, but thank you all for joining. Um, and I, I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Happy Friday.